entitled Follow the Leader. Follow the Leader. You know, uh, I looked at this passage and I was reminded as a kid, some of the different games we used to play. Uh, we, Whenever uh, I, w- I was a, a kid, we used to get, get around down at the, the ballparks there in the community and uh, the kids would get together and we'd there'd be a few of us out there on the court and we would shoot for captains of the basketball teams that would form and uh, for some reason or another, maybe it was my uh, inaccuracy uh, shooting the ball or my, my slowness, I'm not exactly sure, uh, but I, I always seem to get picked towards the end of uh, the, the team assembling. I always thought, you know, big country with OSU, uh, Oklahoma State was pretty good. I don't know why they didn't pick a, a big fellow like myself, but I always seemed to get picked last. Well, then we would play other games like Simon Says, and I fared okay at that. Um, the only game I remember getting picked uh, near the front of the line for was when we'd play tug of war, and uh, then I'd get stuck as the, in the anchor position for some reason. Uh, but, again, but one that, that everybody could su- succeed at, The one that everybody got to participate in was a game called Follow the Leader. Didn't matter uh, your talent, your ability. All you had to do was keep your eyes on the the one that went ahead of you, and you could succeed as long as you kept your eyes on them and did what they did. This morning, I want to remind you as we come to this passage of Scripture here in Mark's Gospel that for the Christian, Jesus is the leader. And our job as followers of his, those of us who have committed our life to him as our Lord and our Savior, is from the day that we make that commitment, from that day on, to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and to follow him in obedience to his word and following his example as he he changes and transforms our lives. This morning I want to share with you from this passage of scripture three truths that lead to transformation in the believer's life so that we can follow Jesus better because no longer, no matter how long you have followed Jesus, we can all follow Jesus better. Amen? So pick up with me here in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. The Bible tells us the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, that had baptized, that at Jesus' baptism had uh, signed off on Jesus being the Savior we need, descended from heaven. That same Spirit, the Spirit, immediately drove him, Jesus, out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Look at verse 14. Now, after John was arrested, that is, John the Baptist, his cousin, Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, that is, the good news of forgiveness in Christ, and saying, verse 15, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Verse 16, passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, that is, Peter, and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Verse 17, And Jesus said to them, Follow me. Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Verse 19, And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Would you pray with me? Father God, we come to you right now. We are so grateful in this moment, in the body of this church, in the life of this church in recent days, we have been reminded that you are indeed a God that hears prayer. God, we thank you and we praise you, Father, that you are attentive to our need. Lord, right now in these next few moments, we ask that you would help us to address our most serious need, our most earnest need in devotion to you, 
following your son. God, would you speak to us? Help us to hear. Help us to heed in obedience what you call us to do. We ask for the one here today that is outside of relationship with Christ, that today would be the day that they decide in faith to follow Jesus and be saved. Those of us here in the room that know Christ, that we would be found more faithful and to follow him closer. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. First truth that leads to transformation in the believer's life that we see here in this passage is Jesus' plan for conquering temptation. Jesus has a plan to help us in the time of temptation if we follow his example here in verses 12 through 14. We see as he is there in the wilderness, the Mark tells us here in his account that Jesus had been in the wilderness some 40 days being tempted by Satan. Not just one of his workers, not just one of his minions, but uh, Satan himself came to tempt Jesus out in the wilderness. But I want you to see, God wants you to see, that as Jesus was tempted, that Jesus left in victory, being a picture of his uh, obedience to the Father, as Jesus came to live a perfect life that you and I could not, so that he could make a payment for our sins for us, when he would go to the cross for us. But Mark tells us that he had been in the desert for fo some 40 days, Mark uh, over Mark leaves out a detail that Matthew and the other Gospels point out, though, in this passage. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 2, Matthew tells us that while he was there fast, that while he was there in the wilderness, that he had been fasting for some 40 days. 40 days he had fasted, and then Satan shows up. Why is it that Jesus was fasting for some 40 days? before Satan showed up because Jesus knew there was a time of temptation coming. And Jesus reveals to us in his plan for conquering temptation that there is a power in communion with God that leads to power over temptation. Power that we don't have in and of ourselves. A power that comes only through our fellowship and our constant connection with Jesus by his spirit alive in us. I want to tell you this morning that victory over temptation does not come by our own strength, our own willpower, or our ability. It comes through our humility and our devotion to Christ as we walk in accord with the Spirit. That's why Paul would tell us in the book of Galatians that if we walk with the Spirit, that we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Instead, we will be so close to him that he will empower us over those things when but the bible tells us that jesus had been fasting uh, these 40 days this is a picture of his communion with god every time the bible mentions fasting it is always in connection with prayer and communion with jesus even in his teaching in the sermon on the mount when jesus taught on fasting just a few verses later the next door neighbor to his teaching there was his teaching on prayer and in the life of the early church if you do a survey of the of the church in the book of acts every decision they made every trial and every test that they overcame was done so by fasting and by prayer that it is the communion with god in our proximity to him that empowers us over temptation I think what the Bible is telling us here is that some of us need to remember that old song that puts it so well. It's not about us, it's about walking with him. One song put it this way, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. The mountain's too high and the valley's too wide. I'm down on my knees where I learn to stand and I can't even walk without you holding my hand now some of y'all may be thinking the preacher is a good uh, jail, jail ministry singer he's uh, behind a few bars looking for a key <laughs> but the power friend listen the power is not in us 
The power is in our vital connection to the Holy Spirit as we commune with him. There is a power in the battle. and Some of us need to pick up God's weapon as we follow Jesus' plan for conquering temptation. The Bible tells us that he had been tempted by Satan. The other Gospels remind us that when Satan came after Jesus had been fasting for some 40 days, that the first area of temptation that Satan came to Jesus in in that hour was the area of his flesh tempting him with food. Satan came to to Jesus and he said, If indeed you are the Son of God, then tell these stones to turn into bread. But Jesus answered the temptation of his flesh, of his desires, with the word of God, saying that God had said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God that proceeds from the mouth of God. And he answered temptation of the flesh that way. And then Satan came to him also, and he took him to a high temple, tempting him in his pride. And he said, okay, Jesus, I know scripture too, and if... You want to quote scripture? I know scripture. Listen, let's get you up on top of this big temple. You cast yourself down, and the Bible says that God will guard you with his angels so that you won't even stub your toe. That's the TL version. uh, On a rock out here in the wilderness. But Jesus said, answering with scripture, that thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. And then Satan tempted him with the pride of life again. Uh, in the in the lust of his eyes as he revealed all the kingdoms of the world to him in a vision and he said Jesus if you will but bow your knee to me I will give you all the kingdoms of this world it's kind of funny how he tried to sell him on something Jesus already owned amen but Jesus knew that there's no shortcuts in salvation that his kingdom would be consummated through the power of the cross as he gave up his life as a ransom for us. And Jesus responded in temptation in that moment with the word of God telling Satan that God had said that you shall serve the Lord God and worship him only. I want to tell you the power is in the word of God. There's nothing special about us. The power is in the authority and the presence of God with us in the moment of temptation. Uh, me and the guys, me and some of the guys anyway, every, everybody's welcome, by the way, to join us anytime. We meet up at McDonald's uh, most days of the week, I think more days than not. And we get up there about 8 o'clock in the morning and we... Uh, chew the fat and solve the world's problems. Amen? Well, on one occasion, I happen to not be there, but uh, some, some of our members acted in a time of need. Apparently, somebody got a little hot under the collar about the, uh, not receiving enough of those coffee creamers, and they were really letting management have it over this. Well, a couple of our guys, they, they weren't going to have that, and so... Uh, but uh, so, sorry, not sorry, Buddy and Don, they walk up behind the gentleman. They didn't say anything. They just walked there to be a presence. But for some reason, he wasn't really impressed with that, and he just kept on, kept on, kept on. And all of a sudden, though, there was a change in demeanor when uh, Cody Wetterman, Cody, stand up right there, would you? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. When he came with a, a little more intimidating and imposing presence, Told you you was going to get famous over that, bud. <laughs> Here old Bud and Don were, not realizing he was behind them. And the gentleman changed his tune because a more intimidating and imposing presence was there. What I want to tell you this morning is the power isn't in us. The power is not in our ability or our strength. The power is in the authority of God that shows up in his word because when we tell the enemy that we are determined to live according to God's word God stands behind us to lead us in victory there's Jesus' plan for conquering temptation here's the second truth that we see here in this passage it's the people that Jesus called the people that Jesus called I am so moved by our Savior how in verse 16 Jesus began calling those who were overlooked by the world. Verse 16 has Jesus coming and he is preaching and he finds 
Simon Peter and his brother Andrew, and he tells them, follow me, follow me. Now, you have to understand the historical context of this. A rabbi in, the, in those days, he would come along and he would find those pupils, those students out in the world that had great promise, great upside. In, the, in their day, they would, the, the schools of the Hebrews, now watch this, the, the young men, the elementary school in Israel was to memorize word for word every word in the Pentateuch, that is the books between Genesis and Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, word for word. And when a young man would show some aptitude, some ability, a rabbi would come along and he would say, you come follow me. And he would teach them. But for others in that society that seemed that they had kind of puttered out, gone as far as, as the world thought that they could go, they would be like these disciples. And they would go take on their daddy's trade. Fishers. Like commoners. Blue collar folks. Regular everyday people. But Jesus came to save anybody and everybody that would follow him. I love how we see the Savior's heart in this as Peter tells us, this same Peter who had been called and saved that day. Peter knew by personal experience, 2 Peter 3, 9, that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance and faith in Jesus. He knew it because Jesus saved him and God wants to save you. I want to tell you this morning that God, why would God choose the unlikely? It is because God is glorified by a humble vessel. That when the world sees him changing your life and the power of, of his gospel, that is what gets the world's attention. Peter and John in Acts chapter 4 verse 13, they were on trial for Jesus in their culture and the seminary trained of that day, those who were educated, these that had followed these rabbis, they noticed the power that these men spoke with when they were told by them to stop preaching about Jesus. They said, well, you guys are the seminary trained. You tell us what we should do. Should we obey you or should we obey God? The answer was obvious. And when they saw the power that these unschooled men spoke with, the Bible tells us that they took note that they had been with Jesus. I want to tell you, Jesus can change our lives and empower us to get the world's attention if we will answer his call to follow him. Jesus called the overlooked. He also called us to get on board with his mission. Look there at verse 17 again. And this is Jesus' commission to them and his commission to us. He said that if you follow me, I will make you become fishers of men. Let me tell you what one preacher said. If you're not a fisher of men, you aren't following Jesus very well. Because he said, if you follow me, I will make you a fisher of men. What does that mean? That you will become empowered to share your faith so others come to follow through your testimony. Mark gives us the cliff notes here, but I, I, I'm so inspired by John's account in John chapter 1. John gives us a little more detail to what happened on this scene as these brothers came. John tells us that Andrew, Peter's brother, had heard John the Baptist proclaiming, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And Andrew was convicted of his sin and his wrongs against God that day, and he placed his faith in Jesus. And then you know what Andrew did? He got busy telling others about Jesus. He took his simple story, and he went and he started in his own family. And he went and told Peter, he said, Bubba, we found the Savior, the Savior. And then Peter, through his brother's testimony, became a Christian, a follower of Jesus. Here at Highland Park, we use a, an Acts 1-8 
faith sharing strategy where we use our relational circles. We begin in our Jerusalem, in our, in our family. We go out to our workplace, into our Judea and Samaria, and then we go out to the ends of the earth in our random encounters. And it's intentional that we would go to the places, as one preacher puts it, that we would go to the places where we live, where we work, and where we play, and we see them as our mission field to join Jesus in his mission so that others would be saved. I want to remind you this morning that witnessing for a Christian is intended to be as natural as breathing. It is not complicated. Despite what the enemy wants us to believe, it is not complicated to share our faith. All of us can do it by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, taking our story and adding Jesus and the difference that he's made. And friends, just like Andrew, you can be empowered to share your faith. One of our, one of our folks that comes regularly, they were asking about this uh, per calendar out front. And he said, uh, do we have any missionaries in here directly related to this church? The Spirit put it on my heart. I just wanted to share with you this morning. Uh, while you won't find them in, in this book, what I can tell you is that this morning in Sunday school, we had 102 missionaries show up in this building. Because God has called you as a believer in Jesus to be a missionary where you live, where you work, where you play. And friend, you can be used to the kingdom to bring others to him. The people he called, and here's the last truth that I want to share with you this morning. That following Jesus leads to a powerful change in the course of your life. Following Jesus changes you changes you from the inside out following Jesus changes everything about you when Jesus came on the scene he came preaching that the good news of forgiveness through faith was here and all we have to do to receive that forgiveness is to repent believing that Jesus is all we need Jesus preached repent. What does it mean to repent? The Greek word repent is a term called metanoia. It means to have a change of mind, a change of heart, a change of disposition and attitude towards Jesus. See, a lot of time what we, what we do is we focus on our behaviors. We focus on those sins, those hang-ups, and we think that what God wants us to do is stop sinning, stop these behaviors. And it's true enough that those disappoint God, those, those are sins and those need to be corrected. But God doesn't start with the outside, the behavior. Because you know what you can do if you change behavior? You can fool a lot of people, but the heart hadn't changed. What God wants us to do is have a change of heart and a change of attitude towards him first. Saying, it, Jesus, it's not about me. It's not about my way anymore. I've been going my way long enough. And I'm ready to follow you and go your way with you as the boss of my life forevermore. One, uh, it, to repent means that you go your way. That you've been going your way. And then when you recognize your personal need to trust in Jesus, that you say, Jesus, I'm tired of going this way, and I am going to turn, and I am going to pursue you for the rest of my life. Whatever you say goes. I may not do it perfectly. I will not do it perfectly, Lord. But the attitude of my heart, regardless of my desires, regardless of my lifestyle, all of it is surrendered to you. And my answer, whatever you say, Jesus, my heart's desire is to say, yes, Lord, to you in every era of my life. That's what it means to follow Jesus, to surrender our plans, our priorities, our lifestyle to Jesus and his word. That's what they did when they left everything to follow Jesus and let him set the agenda for their life. Jesus tells us that the most important thing that we can do, the way that we begin this, is to decide to follow Jesus. He said, follow me. 
follow me. This is a term of relationship. It's not a checklist of things that we, of activities that we check off and then we set aside. It is a lifelong choosing to follow Jesus for the rest of your life. Staying near him, watching him, observing him, looking in, in his word at his example of, what, of how he lived and saying, Lord, help me to live like you so the world sees you in me. Of saying, Lord, you say this in your word and I, I know that my life isn't reflecting your design and your desire for me. God, help me to experience this transformation through my obedience and walk in faith and fellowship with you. These disciples, as they left their father's boats, they began a new life. A new life of relationship with Jesus. They watched Jesus. They talked with him when they had questions and problems that they couldn't solve. And as they talked and they witnessed Jesus, they saw him answer. Aren't you glad that he's a prayer answering God and we can experience that? They listened to him. How do we know they listened? Because we have his word recorded for us because of their listening to Jesus. And most of all, they they desired to remain as close as possible to this Jesus in a new life for him. Me and my boy, uh, well, the kids in general, but uh, most recently, me and my son, we were having one of those bedtime chats. Discipleship at the bedside, I like to call it, informally. We had been telling the stories about Jesus I had this passage on, on my mind, preparing my heart, because I always ask Jesus to do something in me first before I step in here. Preparing my heart for this, and I tell him the story about Andrew and Simon coming and following Jesus. Asher asked a seminary-sized theological question. He said, but Daddy, what, how do you do it? How do you follow Jesus and all that stuff? How? You know how we follow him? We follow him through prayer. Talking to him when our life is in a pinch and we need his power to get through. We follow him by looking to his word and the life that he lived. We follow him by trial and error. You know what we call that? Faith learning from our mistakes and trusting him that his grace is sufficient to cover us. But all of this starts, following him, starts with a decision. You need to make a personal decision in a moment of time to follow Jesus for yourself. When Andrew came and he told Peter about what God had done in his life, how he'd found the Savior, Peter's response could have been, oh, that's great, that's great. Brother, I, I'm so happy for you. You know, I believe in Jesus too. I mean, you believe in him, I believe in him. But Peter made a personal choice to come to the Savior for himself and to say, Jesus, I need you. I need you, Jesus. And would you save me? Friend, he saved back then. He'll save today if you'll just tell him. Today, right now, I'm a sinner. God, I've broken your rules, and I need your life-changing salvation to forgive me and restore my relationship with you. And, friend, it's no magical incantations. It's your heart of faith. If you will say that to God in faith today, he will save you. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved, Romans 10, 13 tells us. What about you, friend? What about you? Has there been a time where you have personally decided, I'm following Jesus in salvation, in forgiveness? Today's the day for you. If you're here and you'd say, Pastor, yes, I know. I, I made that commitment years ago. Could I ask you about your relationship with him today? It's not a relationship of years ago. It's a relationship about today. Are you following him today as closely as you are? And if not, 
why don't you come back to him and say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I know I'm saved, but I need to follow you and recommit today. Maybe you have somebody in your family that needs salvation. You come to this altar. It'll be open. Would you stand with me?